Okay, good morning, everybody. Thanks for braving the cold this morning. Um, let's dive right back in. Just a reminder about uh, assignments. Undergrads, you're working on adding motors to your robot in assignment five. Grad students, you're completing the ninth and then the final assignment uh, in the original round of assignments. And then as promised, next Tuesday morning, graduate students, you will start in on the first of the differentiable robotics design uh, assignments. And I will talk briefly about what those are on Tuesday. Question. What's, on, what's happening on Monday? I can never keep track. President's Day. President's Day. Uh, yes, I believe I will be available. I may not be here, it may be remote, but I'll make a note. Yes, to office hours uh, on Monday. My apologies to US presidents. Okay, any other questions? All good? Okay, so uh, just to reorient you as to where we are in the lecture material, we finished lecture seven last time, hopefully for you on a high note, where we looked at this particular evolved neural network that is able to distinguish between triangles and rectangles with no triangle detector, no rectangle detector detectable inside the neural network. The way in which it's able to exhibit this particular building block of intelligence, which is being able to distinguish certain things from others, is a function of the way this thing moves, its interaction with the environment, its ability to remember past sensation, timing, space, you name it. It all brings it together in order to solve the problem. We cannot localize this particular building block of intelligence, which is categorization to anywhere inside the brain or the body of the robot. This slide, if you forget what embodied cognition is all about, bookmark this slide and come back to it as we go. Okay, any questions about any of that from last time? Okay, so that finished uh, our introduction of the first two assignments, uh, the first two assignments, the first two experiments that kicked off the field of evolutionary robotics in the 90s. Uh, we're now gonna dive into lectures eight and nine where we're, we're gonna look at a series of minimal cognition experiments. These also took place at the beginning uh, of the field. And the idea behind the minimal cognition experiments was to strip away as much of the complexity of the robot's body, its brain, and its environment as possible so that we'd have a minimal environment, minimal robot, minimal robot brain, and in sequence investigate or evolve into that robot various building blocks of intelligence. You might remember from lecture two in our history of AI, decades were spent and are still being spent trying to define what intelligence is. Is ChatGPT intelligent or not? I don't know, it depends on your definition of intelligence. So as you'll see in the minimal cognition experiments, a different tack is taken in the attempt to try and create intelligent machines, which is to identify certain features of intelligent behavior, or certain features of behavior that you would expect to see in an intelligent machine, regardless of whether that's a biological machine or a technological machine. What do you think some of those building blocks of intelligence might be? We just mentioned, mentioned one of them for the gantry robot, which is categorization. Tell triangles from rectangles, friend from foe, food from poison, um, potential mate from aggressor, so on and so forth. If you want to survive in this world, you need to be able to distinguish between A and B. That's a, a building block of intelligence. Some equivalent ability to act in the world, to push on the world. Okay, so to act on the world and observe how it pushes back, so that would include all the Breitenberg vehicles. Yeah, that's probably a building block of intelligence. Could be a little bit more specific. You're all intelligent machines. You can categorize. What else? Communication. Sorry? Communication. Communication. Great. We're not going to see that in the minimal cognition experiments, but we are going to see it when we get to uh, collective robotics. But absolutely, being able to communicate with your peers. Other potential building blocks of intelligence? Um, being, able to react to your being able to react to your environment, see what's coming in, and decide what to do. 
planning, being able to think ahead. A really important hallmark of intelligence is not getting trapped in a corner in the future to keep your options open, right? A building block of intelligence, that, that's the idea. We're gonna see, we may or may not get to lecture nine today, in the minimal cognition experiments, we're gonna see the evolution of very, very simple robots that are able to exhibit more and more of these building blocks of intelligence. At which point you wanna to point to that evolved robot and say, now it's intelligent, now it's thinking, now it understands, now it has free will, now it has consciousness, that's up to you. We're gonna approach, approach this in a very operational way. The robot should be able to behave in this way, and that way, and that way, and that way, and so on, yeah? Okay, before we get there, however, in the minimal cognition experiments, all of the robots in the minimal cognition experiments use a particular kind of neural network controller, which is known as a CTRNN. So we're gonna spend some time this morning looking at this particular type of neural network. And as you'll see when we talk about CTRNNs, CTRNNs make it easier for the evolutionary algorithm to evolve intelligent building blocks for the robots. The neural networks that we've been talking about so far are very, very, very simple. They go back to our Breitenberg vehicles. We have circles representing uh, biological neurons, and our arrows are representing biological synapses. We figure out how to wire up the sensor neurons to the motor neurons. We might throw some hidden neurons in the middle. Once we wired everything up, we need one number for each synapse, which is the weight of influence that that presynaptic neuron has on that postsynaptic neuron. And then we also need an activation function for our, uh, our hidden and motor neurons because the raw sum arriving at that neuron may be outside some bound and our activation function is gonna squash that value back to some range and then possibly pass that value on. As you can imagine, this is a gross simplification of how actual biological neurons and synapses work. So within robotics and AI and computational neuroscience, there is a, a very large community, the community that's interested in creating a more accurate model of biological neural networks and then investigating whether and how that additional biological detail makes it easier for us to make intelligent machines. We're gonna do a little bit of that in lectures eight and nine. We're gonna look at CTRNNs, which include some additional biological details into these neural networks. And then we're gonna see in lecture nine how that makes it easier for the evolutionary algorithm to evolve intelligent behavior for robots controlled by CTRNNs. Sound good? Okay, that's our preview for what we're doing in the next two lectures. All right, here we go. Uh, CTRNNs stands for Continuous Time Recurrent Neural Networks, and we're going to tackle each noun and adjective in this name as we go. In order to do so, we're gonna need to do a little bit of calculus. Deep breath, this is the only place in the course for the undergraduates where you're gonna to have to do a little bit of calculus. For the graduate students that are gonna be tackling the differentiable robot design, you're gonna see calculus uh, again. We're not gonna to do too much calculus, so just to remember what calculus actually is, turns out for a lot of branches of science and engineering and for robotics, we often want to be able to describe how a particular variable changes as a function of another variable. Here's arguably the simplest experiment, uh, ex example of this. We've got one variable here, x, and we've got one variable, y, here. And as you can see from this line here, as x changes, i changes in exactly the same way. Right? This is y equals x. In calculus, what we often want to do is describe at a particular point for this variable, we want to be able to explain how y is changing at exactly that point. So what is the delta in y as the delta of x becomes smaller and smaller and smaller? And hopefully this is reminding you of your first year calculus class where it gets exceedingly difficult until it becomes infinitely difficult when delta x becomes zero. So way back in the day, 
uh, some folks invented this idea of calculus, which is a way to describe instantaneous change of one variable y as a function of x. And that's what's written down here. And my apologies, I've switched from variables x and y to x and t. This is a little bit confusing, so I should really update this slide. On the horizontal axis here, we're going to assume that the variable we're interested in is t for time. We're going to see in continuous time recurrent neural networks how the values of neurons change as a function of time. So we've got t on the horizontal axis here and x on the horizontal axis here. And dx over t tells us that we're going to write down on the right-hand side of this equal sign how x changes, where x is going to be in a moment. x is going to be the value of the neuron. How does the value of the neuron change as a function of time? In my super cartoony example here, dx over tt equals 1. This is a differentiable, uh, sorry, a differential equation. We're going to see a bunch of differential equations this morning. What you're doing at the moment in your neural networks, if you've gotten that, that far, is actually to use difference equations. We write the value of a neuron at a new time step at time t plus 1 as a function of the old value of the neuron plus some other stuff. We can try and write down how this function changes as a function of, or sorry, how this variable changes as a function of this variable. We can try and write it down as a difference equation where we've got discrete time steps, which is what we usually have in a physics engine. Or we can write down how this variable changes as a function of this one in a continuous manner using a differential, uh, differential equation. Okay, the rate of change of x, what this equation says is the rate of change in x is equal to the rate of change of t. Familiar to everybody? So far so good? All right, okay. Okay, so the con c to an ends, the continuous time is because we're going to write down and describe the behavior of these neurons, not in discrete time. We're going to write down the behavior of these neurons as differential equations. So we're going to describe and simulate the behavior of these neurons in continuous time. That's the CT and CR, CTRNNs. What about the recurrent part? This should be familiar. We've already talked about recurrence in neural networks. There are synapses that connect to output neurons, like previous time steps. They are yes. So that we have we're going to have in C turn ends, as we'll see in a moment, recurrent synapses that can connect from the output back to the input or from the output back to the hidden. They're kind of flowing, instead of flowing from sensation to motors and actions, they flow backwards, which creates a loop and allows the robot to hold on and remember, or allows the neural network to hold on and remember stuff. Okay. Okay. So in a, in a C tier and N, we are going to write down a set of ordinary differential equations, where we, if we have a set of k ordinary differential equations, those represent the behaviors of the k neurons inside the CTRNN. If we have a CTRNN with 28 neurons, we're going to write down a set of 28 ordinary differential equations. So things are already getting more complicated compared to the traditional neural networks you're familiar with. Okay, you see a big red box here. I, I highly encourage you to write down these equations as we go. As you all know, if you just sit and stare at equations, they don't soak in. So I invite you to write along with me as we build out one of these differential equations. Uh, as you'll see, I've spaced out where to add the terms because we're gonna add detail to this differential equation as we go. So leave space as you annotate this. Okay, so let's start with the left-hand side of the equal sign. We've got y sub i prime. So the prime is just gonna remind, this is shorthand for dy over dt. So we're gonna describe, uh, and I'm sorry, I keep switching back and forth between variable names. Typically, y is used in all the papers that describe CTRNNs. 
Y sub I is going to represent the value of the ith neuron in the CTRNN. We're, I'm not going to have you write down 28 differential equations. It's a waste of time. So we're just going to write down y sub i to, remi to remind us that this particular differential equation that we're going to build up is the, uh, the differential equation describing the behavior of the ith neuron in the CTRNN. OK. All right. Let's start by placing minus y sub i to the right of this differential, differential equation. Why would we add this particular term? Does anybody have any neural science experiment? This particular term is representing a, a particular behavior of biological neurons. Anybody see yet what it is? Nate? Uh, good question. So you mentioned spiking. So for those that are not familiar with uh, the behavior of neurons, they tend to emit a spike or a pulse of electricity, and then they go quiet again. And it's often the, the, uh, the distance or the bunching up of these spikes that is representing the information that one neuron is sending to another. CTRNNs are not simulating that particular detail of neurons. There are other neural network models that do represent spiking. This is not one of them. Is it like a sine wave or something? Uh, not quite. Emily? OK. Ah, damping. We're getting close. OK, let's actually try and draw a geometric representation of what this differential, di differential, this differential equation is doing. As you may remember, when you're going to simulate or integrate a differential equation, you need to give it an initial value. So let's imagine we have a single uh, neuron in our CTRNN. And we, so we've got the value of this neuron. At the beginning of us simulating this neuron, we need to set it to some value. We can imagine that this single neuron is sitting inside of a Breitenberg vehicle, and it's connected to a sensor, and that sensor is supplying a value of plus one, let's say, just hypothetically. So the neuron is receiving a value of one, and then this differential equation is going to describe how the value of this neuron changes, assuming it doesn't receive any more input. This is just a hypothetical situation. If the current value of the neuron is plus 1 at t equals 0, what happens as time starts to move forward? What happens as dy over dt, d starts to increase? If our differential equation is saying the rate of change of y with respect to t is decreasing as a function of the current value of y, what starts happening? It approaches zero. So if we move some arbitrary distance forward, and remember our differential equation is operating in continuous time, so we can just t pick some arbitrary point in time. As t increases, the rate of change of y decreases as a function of this. So we can take this value of plus 1 and plug it in here and say the rate of change at this moment is minus 1. So the value starts to decrease. Let's imagine at this particular point in time, the new value of the neuron is 0.8. Tell me about the new value of the neuron as we continue to move forward in time. Now it's like decreasing slightly less. It's decreasing at a lower rate, right? Y prime equals minus 0.8. The rate of decrease was 1. Now the rate of decrease is minus 8. So now it's maybe 0 0.7, 0 0.7. And as Nate says, if we keep going, the neuron will start to approach a value of 0. We plug in a value of 1. We excite the neuron with a value of 1. And then we stop exciting the neuron. And what does the neuron do? It relaxes back to 0. What feature of neurons are we simulating by adding this term to our differential equation? Is 
the inhibition? It's not quite inhibition. So we don't have any, we don't have neurons connected together yet. In our hypothetical C to an N, we have one neuron, no synapses. So nothing's inhibiting anything else. We just have this single neuron. Let's try another example. Let's take the exact same C to an N, one neuron, which is being simulated by this differential equation. And now we assume that at a particular point in time, it receives a value of minus one. Some sensor that this neuron is connected to sends a signal of minus one, and then the sensor shuts off. The neuron doesn't get any more external stimulation. What does this what does the neuron start to do now as we run forward in time from this event? Absolutely. So it's at minus one. The rate of change, uh, the rate of change of y is equal to minus minus one, the current value of y. So the rate of change at this moment in time is plus one. So at a short time later, we've got a value of minus. 0.8. At this moment in time, we plug that value of y sub i in, and we get the rate of change of y is equal to minus, minus 0.8. So the rate of change of y at this moment in time is plus 8. It's increasing by a slightly lesser amount, and this neuron starts to approach 0. What about this initial value, or this initial value, or this, 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 this? What happens in all of these cases? They all go towards zero. Go towards zero. This is rep uh, Emily. Yes. Uh, resting membrane potential. The the first adjective is right. The resting. One of the things that neurons are above all else is lazy. Given the fact that nothing else is going on, they will slowly relax back to resting potential or using as little oxygen as possible. Your brain is about 2% of your total mass, but it uses up 20% of all the oxygen you breathe and everything you eat. Brains are massive energy hogs. It makes very good sense for neurons when they're quote unquote not needed for anything to relax back to a low energy state. That's what this particular term in the differential equation is doing. As we continue to go through and add, material, add, add, bio, add mathematical detail to how these neurons are behaving, we're adding in additional biological details of how actual biological neurons work. So far, so good. So everyone can see the correspondence between this equation and our simulation of how this neuron behaves. OK. All right. Let's add in an additional detail. A neuron that will just relax to 0 uh, if it's not stimulated, not very useful for anything. We're going to add in an additional term here, which is a time constant. So this is tau sub i. The sub i is there to remind us that we actually have k ordinary differential equations for each of the k neurons in the C tier and N. So each neuron has its own time constant. It's called a constant because it means that throughout the simulation of the C tier and N, this value is not changing. We're going to set it. Y changes as we simulate a neuron, but the time constant does not. Is that like a parameter you set before? It's a parameter not you set. As you might guess, the evolutionary algorithm is going to start setting these parameters. So as we build up this ordinary differential equation, there's going to be a mixture of variables, which are the things that are simulated and change over time, and a set of parameters which the evolutionary algorithm is going to try and set. It's going to try and find good settings for these parameters to get the robot that's equipped with that C tier and N to do whatever it is we want the robot to do, like we've seen before. So far, so good? OK. You may or may not have seen this before. Um, this is putting, obviously, a parameter on the left-hand side of a differential <laughs> equation. Usually, we put everything on the right-hand side. Um, we could do that by dividing both sides of the, the differential equation by tau sub i. And now we've got to write minus y sub i divided by tau. 
Not only are these neurons lazy, but the people that created CTRNNs are lazy and didn't want to bother writing out everything as a fraction, so they just put it on the left-hand side, so everything fits nicely on one line. This is just kind of a notation thing. Yeah. If you feel uncomfortable about looking at this with stuff on the left-hand side, you can mentally divide both sides by tau sub i. Okay. Let's imagine, let's keep things simple. Let's assume that our time constants are going to be positive values. We can set them to anything. 0. 0.0001, we can set them to 10 to the 8, anything, any floating point value that's a positive number. What does a neuron with a low time constant do? Let's assume that the time constant is set to something very, very close to 0, 0. 0.00001. How does that neuron behave compared to this neuron? It takes longer. It either takes longer or goes more quickly towards the zero. Uh -huh. Okay. One of those two statements is correct. We still have minus y sub i, so this thing is still lazy. If it's not being stimulated, it whatever its value is, it'll gradually decay back to zero, to rest. With a low time constant, does it approach that asymptote quickly or slowly? Uh, if the lower time constant can be, I think, quicker because it's, you're dividing by the time constant. Correct. So let's go through this. We're setting tau sub i, let's set it equal to 0 0.001, right? Just so you fix a number in your head. Multiply both sides of the ordinary differential equation by 0 0.001, and we've got y prime equals minus y divided by 0 0.0001. So suddenly, every, everything that we compute on the right-hand side tends to be a very, very big number, which means the rate of change is big, right? So if we go back to our example of setting uh, a value of y to 1, and then not stimulating that neuron anymore, we've got on the right-hand side minus 1 divided by 0. 0.0001, and we've got a huge negative number, right? The slope at this point is now very precipitous. It's dropping. So, boom, down goes the value of the neuron to 0. 0.02. Now we want to keep simulating the behavior of this neuron as time increases. So we plug in on the right-hand side minus 0.2 divided by 0. 0.0001. Boom. What's happened? So we've overshot. That's going to start projecting in the opposite direction. Absolutely. So we've <laughs> overshot by, let's say, minus 0. 0.1. We've overshot. Now what happens? It goes up. If we plug in uh, minus, minus 0.1 on the right-hand side, we now have plus 0.1 divided by plus 0.0001. Boom. We've got a, a precipitous increase. What does this particular neuron do? Absolutely. It's still asymptotically approaching zero. It's still trying to get to rest, but it's continuously overshooting and oscillating. This is known as the Woody Allen neuron. It's neurotic. Any little stimulation and it goes absolutely bananas. It's depressed. It's super elated. It's all over the place. It's very, very sensitive. You can do this, hopefully now, in your head. You can simulate this same Woody Allen neuron now with an initial value of minus 0 0.01. What does it do? Same thing. It's all over the place. Okay. Let's imagine a different uh, neuron where everything's exactly the same. We're going to set its initial value to plus one. Now we're going to set a very high time constant. 10 to the 8, let's say. What does this neuron do if its initial value is plus one? It goes through very, very 
It approaches very slowly. We plug in plus one on the right-hand side, so we have minus plus one, minus 0.1 divided by 10 to the 8 is minus 0.0000001, a slope like this. If we start with a value of minus 1, what does the neuron with a very high time constant do? Same thing, right? Very, very slowly approaching rest. Everybody remember Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh? Very chill individual, very happy to just not do anything. You can prod Eeyore with immense strength and it'll take quite a bit to get Eeyore moving. And even when Eeyore starts moving, he doesn't move very quickly. Yeah, very, very resistant to external perturbation. Yeah, okay, let's keep going. Oh, I forgot to mention, we've added this time constant. This is also true of different uh, neurons in your brain. Certain neur neurons are very sensitive and they will start emitting spikes with the, the least provocation. They're very, very sensitive and they will react to the, the smallest provocation. There are other Eeyore neurons in various parts of your brain and spinal cord that take quite a bit of external electrical stimulation in order to start emitting spikes. <coughs> so again, as we go, we're adding biological detail here. So far, so good? Okay, let's keep going. This part, hopefully, looks somewhat familiar to you. We are now adding to the right-hand side of our ordinary differential equation a summation term. As we compute the value of the ith neuron at any point in time, we are visiting plus, uh, uppercase n uh, other neurons in the CTRNN and pulling out their values and multiplying their values by the weight that connects that neuron, the jth neuron, to i, the neuron's value that we're currently computing. Okay, so again, we have a whole bunch of ODEs, ordinary differential equations in our set here that are simulating all these other neurons. So as we move forward, we're gonna assume now in our hypothetical CTRNN that we don't have just one neuron, we have uppercase N neurons and we have uppercase N differential equations. We're just looking at one of them. So far, so good? Okay. Here's where the recurrent part of CTRNNs comes in. You'll notice that as we iterate from one to uppercase N, we're not skipping over any values in the uppercase N neurons, which means as we're computing the summation, at some point, as J is increasing from one to uppercase N, J hits I. It's t the neuron is taking its own value and multiplying its own value by the weight that connects it to itself. There's a particular type of recurrent connection, which is a self-connection. Okay, so we've been drawing, we've been drawing uh, neural networks so far in a layered manner, and this is typically how neural networks are drawn. In our case, for robotics, we have a sensor, uh, a set of sensor neurons, then we have a bunch of hidden neurons, and then we have a bunch of motor neurons. Um, as you'll see, if you look at any of the publications about CTRNNs, CTRNNs are not drawn in that way. The neurons are arranged in a circle, and every neuron is connected by a synapse to every other neuron. including itself. Okay, so in my cartoon example here, we've got uh, uppercase N equals six neurons. How many synapses do we have? We've got six neurons, we've got six differential equations, we've got six time constants, one time constant for each, if this is one, two, three, four, five, 
six neurons. We've got tau sub one, tau sub two. Maybe this is a Woody Allen neuron. Maybe this is an Eeyore neuron. Maybe this one has some intermediate time constant, which means it's not too sensitive, not too, uh, not too phlegmatic. How many synapses do we have? 36, right? So they're all contained in, let's say, a matrix, a six by six matrix. So, so far, if we were to deploy this neural network into a robot, the evolutionary algorithm needs a genotype that contains 36 numbers, the 36 weights, plus the six tau constants. The evolutionary algorithm can tune the reactivity of the neurons and how the neurons influence one another. So far, so good? We'll keep things simple and assume that time constants are positive numbers and weights can be negative or positive numbers. Negative weights, as you'll remember, create inhibitory connections and positive uh, synaptic weights create excitatory connections. So far, so good? Okay. Here's something that, again, hopefully is familiar. We're adding our activation function, which squashes the value of a neuron to some range. In C tier and Ns, the activation function that's usually used is hyperbolic tangent, which will take any values and squash them to a value between minus one and one. For our purposes, it doesn't really matter what this particular activation function is. What is of interest to us is you'll notice that the activation function is placed in an odd place in the equation. It's kind of inside this summation term. Anybody have any intuition for why they're putting it there? Th that is true. Yeah, that is a true detail of biological neural networks. That, that doesn't dictate why they're putting the activation function in here. So I guess the alternative to that would be to apply it whenever you're calculating the value of the neuron, which means all of the best intermediate values are going to be in that sixth range. Yep. So by not doing that, you're allowing the neuron values to stay in a broad range That's it exactly. So by putting it, by putting the activation function in here, inside the neuron itself, if we were to look inside, the value of that neuron can range greatly. But the moment we read, sorry, let's add a connection going from this neuron to this neuron. The moment we read out the value of the jth neuron, the minute we read out that value, because we're going to take the value of that neuron and multiply it by the weight for it to influence the ith neuron, the moment we read out that value, at that moment of readout, bang, that's when we apply the activation function. So that the value that's coming out of here is always guaranteed to be a value between minus 1 and plus 1. All these other pieces that simulate the behavior of the neuron might cause that neuron to take on very high magnitude negative numbers or very high magnitude positive numbers. No problem. Fine. Whatever the neuron does behind closed doors, that's fine. When we need it to influence something beyond its own borders, then we squash it. That's why the activation function is put in here. So far, so good? OK. In a C tier and N, we have yet another uh, parameter associated with each neuron, which is G, the gain of the neuron. If we have six neurons and six differential equations, we have six Gs, the, the gain for each neuron. You can see that the gain is placed right inside this activation function, right next to the raw internal value of the neuron. What is the gain parameter doing? The very name of this parameter kind of is a very strong hint. It's just straight multiplier for the value. It's a straight multiplier. That's what this equation is telling us. But what is that 
multiplication representing. Uh, a strengthened connection between the neuron. It's not actually, the gain is not being applied to W, which is the connection between pairs of neurons. The gain is being applied directly to the neuron's value. What is this representing? Like how well the neuron can sense? How well the neuron can sense. It's not in the incoming value of the neuron. We have the value, the raw internal value of the neuron, and then we're multiplying it by G. And again, we're going to add all these Gs to the genotype of an evolutionary algorithm that's going to be evolving the behavior of these neurons. Strength of the signal? Strength of the signal. It's literally the gain. Imagine a neuron that has a G of zero. What does that do to the neuron? Is it a constant? Or it, it's, uh, it's not a constant. It's a parameter. So, but it stays constant throughout the simulation of the neuron, just like the time constant as well. Sorry, this, yeah, there's a little bit of confusion about terminology. It stays constant during the simulation of the neural network, but over evolutionary time, evolution might change G's and tau's. Great question. What's the difference between gain and synaptic weight here? Uh, absolutely. So let's go through this. Let's imagine, let's go back to assuming we're looking at a particular neuron in the CTRNN, and this neuron has a gain of zero. It's also connected to all the other neurons. If this neuron has a gain of zero, what does that mean? You bit, you're just, it's gone. It's as if it's not there. A gain of zero is literally silencing that neuron. It doesn't matter how strong the weights of connection are. This is the difference. This neuron might be wired up to this other one with a very strong weight of influence, but this neuron can just, it's muffled. It can never speak. Anytime anyone asks for a value of y sub j, if we're computing the value of the ith neuron and we're computing the right-hand side of this differential equation and we get to the jth neuron, we're multiplying it by zero. It's as if it's not there. Yeah? So as someone was just saying, gain is like the volume. If evolution over evolutionary time is altering the Gs of the neurons, it's changing the volume of these neurons. It can turn down the volume or the gain of some of these neurons to zero, and in essence, <clears throat> remove them from influencing anything else. It can also increase gain and make that neuron very loud, even with very small, uh, even with very small influences, if this neuron is very loud, it's going to tend to increase its influence on everybody else. Now, evolution could set all of the outgoing, could set all of the outgoing synapses of a particular neuron to zero, and that would be another way to shut up the neuron. But evolution's got to come up with mutations that bring all of these to zero. The gains are basically like uh, giving the evolutionary algorithm a shortcut. If for whatever reason it's useful for evolution to turn off or silence, or alternatively to turn up the volume or the overall influence of particular neurons, it's easier for evolution to do it because it just needs to change one number, the gain for that neuron, as opposed to changing uppercase N numbers the weights of all of the uppercase N outgoing synapses from that neuron. So far, so good? Okay, almost, almost done. Theta sub J. We're gonna throw in another six numbers. We're gonna throw in a theta for each neuron in the differential equation. What does bias do? What does high bias do? What does low bias do? It could be completely off here, but is it basically like a different direction? It absolutely is. So 
different value, bias represents the fact that biological neurons have different resting potential. So when we started draw, way back drawing the behavior of Y, we were seeing the value of the neuron always dropping back to a resting value of zero. That's not true in practice. Different, bio, different neurons in your brain and your spinal cord, if they're not being influenced by things from outside, they will drop back to a certain rate of emitting spikes, or basically a, a rate of activity, which is actually not so restful for the neuron. It's got to burn oxygen in order to do that. For whatever reason, that seems to be a useful thing in biological machines. It makes sense for different neurons, if they're not being stimulated, to start to rest at different positive values or different negative values. For whatever reason, my understanding and reading of the neurobiology uh, literature is still not quite known why that's the case, but it is. So they threw it in. Okay, let's just take a breath to review everything we've seen here. We've got variables in this equation, which are all the y's. These are all our variables. We have a fixed function, the activation function, and then we've got a whole bunch of parameters, taus, w's, g's, and thetas. If we have a C CTRNN with six neurons and therefore six ordinary differential equations, what is the length of a genotype that encodes values for all of these parameters? A little bit of arithmetic this morning. We're checking our intuition that we understand how all these pieces fit together. How many tows do we have? Six. six. We've got six tows. How many W's do we have? 36, right? We've got six neurons, and every neuron is connected to every other neuron, including itself. So this neuron has six outgoing weights, uh, out, six outgoing synapses, another six outgoing synapses, another six, six, 12, 18, 24, uh, 30, 36 total synapses. So 6 plus 36, 42, an auspicious number. How many Gs do we have? 6. So we've got a total of 48 parameters plus, plus 6 biases. I lost count now. What are we at? 54? So a 6 neuron, CTRNN, has 54 total uh, parameters that need to go into the genotype. If we take a random set of 54 floating point values and assign that to the CTRNN, those neurons are going to start, those six neurons are going to start changing values in a particular way. If we take a different set of 54 floating point values and download that onto our six neuron CTRNN, those neurons are going to start changing in a different way. Yeah? The evolutionary algorithm is downloading one set of 54 values after the other onto the CTRNN. As we're going to see in a few moments, that CTRNN is controlling a robot. The robot does something. Evolution deletes the set of 54 parameters that cause the robot to do poorly at whatever we want the robot to do. And the evolutionary algorithm makes randomly modified copies of the length 54 vector that caused the robot to do a little bit better at whatever we want it to do and rinse and repeat. That part is familiar. We've seen that before. So far, so good? OK, last piece. Horrible notation. This time, it's not my fault. This is uh, uppercase i sub lowercase i. For the mathematicians in the room, my apologies on behalf of the authors of CTRNNs. OK. This additional term tacked on to the end is meant to represent the input that's coming into the CTRNN from outside. When we started our discussion of CTRNNs this morning, I said, imagine that a neuron is set to some particular value at a given point in time. We're going to drop these CTRNNs into robots and connect the robot sensors to some of the neurons in the CTRNN. So we've got our six 
We've got our six neuron C, T, R, and N here. Let's assume that four of them are connected to four sensors. Sorry, this is getting a little messy. We're going to connect. We're going to assume we're going to drop our six neuron C, T, R, and N into a robot that has four sensors, and I'll just draw them as squares to distinguish them from neurons. We've got four sensors. We can imagine that these are touch sensors, so they're binary sensors that are either sending minus one or plus one into the ordinary differential equation for that neuron. So if we have six neurons like this, we have six ordinary <coughs> differential equations, two of those six ordinary differential equations are missing this term. They just don't have it. The other four uh, <laughs> differential equations each have this term, and they are receiving, or that neuron is receiving, the value of the, neur that, neuron, the value of that sensor at that time step is tacked onto the end of the differential equation and obviously influences not the value of the neuron, it influences how the value of the neuron changes. We're dealing with continuous time neural networks. What happens if for the IF neuron, its particular sensor at a particular point in time fires with a value of plus one? How does that influence the behavior of neuron I at that moment? Any ideas? We've got, we just added plus one <laughs> to the right-hand side of this differential equation. How is that sensor value influencing the behavior of the IF neuron? Does it make the loop go more positive? More, more positive, great, right? It doesn't necessarily make it go positive because the rate of change of this neuron is also being influenced at that moment in time by a whole bunch of other things. Who knows what else is going on? Maybe all the rest of this stuff is setting the rate of change of this neuron to be negative. So it's, the neuron is poised to decrease in value moving forward in time. Maybe this value that's arriving is making its drop slightly less. It's making its rate of change more positive. Not necessarily positive, but more positive. This neuron, let's say it's receiving an incoming sensory value of minus one. We're tacking at that point in time a minus one onto the right-hand side of this differential equation. It's making the rate of change of this neuron at that moment in time more negative. Not necessarily negative, but more negative. Therefore, the initial condition term? It's, uh, not necessarily the initial conditions, because we can take our six neuron C, T, R, and N, drop it into a four sensor uh, robot, and then at every point in time that we simulate that robot and we sim integrate or compute the value of these ODEs, of these differential equations, the values of the neuron, the values of the synapses are, uh, sorry, the values of the sensors are influencing these four neurons at every time step. So it's not necessarily initial conditions, it's a forcing term. The, the sensors out here are continuously influencing the rate of change of the neurons. Are the sensors only influencing the rate of change of the neurons that have sensors? Right? Correct. The, in, in our cartoon example down here, uh, the first and the sixth neuron do not have any sensor attached to them. So the first and sixth differential equation do not have a, this term associated with them. Their behavior is only influenced by all the other neurons and then their own internal parameters, tau, g, theta. Make sense? Okay, again, this term is influencing a biological detail of neuro biological neurons, which is the vast majority of the neurons in you are influenced only by other neurons. There is a vanishingly small fraction of neurons in your body that are being influenced by the outside world. 
The neurons right close to the back of your eye are being more or less influenced by incoming photons. There's a little bit of intermediate steps that are going on, but basically the firing rate of those neurons very close to the back of your eye are being influenced by the rate of, the rate of incoming photons. Same thing with the neurons that are inside the cochlea, inside the part of your <coughs> inner ear. They're being influenced more or less by the pressure waves that are coming from my voice, and so on. Yeah? Okay. All good? Okay, how are we doing for time? We've got 20 minutes left. Okay, so that's a lot of theory. What we're going to do in the next 20 minutes is look at an application of CTRNNs. We're going to look at an application of CTRNNs not to the minimal cognition experiments. We're going to look, uh, we're going to apply them to a more complicated robot to see why CTRNNs are more useful for evolving intelligent behavior than the simpler, less biologically realistic neural networks that we've seen so far. Okay, and that'll finish off lecture eight. This is a bit of a complicated experiment, so if you don't get all the details, that's okay. This is sort of mostly meant for the grad students, for the undergrads, follow along as best you can. Okay, here we go. We're going to deal with this cute little robot here. This little robot here, as you can see, is going, is, uh, as you can probably guess, is equipped with, by, with a CTRNN. There's a whole bunch of these continuous time recurrent neurons inside. And this robot is being trained to try and grasp and manipulate this small block that's placed in front of it. Here you can see the human teacher helping this robot. As this robot is moving, sensor information is coming from its hands and from it, the camera in its head. Those, those sensor neurons, those sensor values are flowing into the CTRNN that's controlling this robot. And then some of the neurons inside the CTRNN are sending values out to the motors. The one thing that we haven't discussed yet about these CTRNNs, we see how they receive values from outside, but how do they send values to the outside? We haven't really talked about that, but you can assume that another subset of the neurons, whatever the value of that neuron is, it just gets sent to a motor. Remember that whenever we read out a value from inside a neuron, we squash it with the activation function. So we're sending values that range between minus one and plus one. We're sending that to the motors of the robot. Okay. We'll talk about this little figure in the upper left in a moment. Okay, I'm going to play this short clip again. You'll notice that the robot has evolved the ability to lift this block up and down a few times, and then it's evolved the ability to move this block left and right a few times. Not a very sophisticated set of behaviors, but even in this admittedly simple demonstration, this robot is showing a particular hallmark of intelligent behavior, which is the ability to stitch together a couple of simple motor behaviors in sequence. These are known as motor primitives. You are all intelligent machines. When you learn a new behavior, like learning to walk, learning to run, learning to kick a ball, learning to play the piano, learning to play the violin, as you learn more and more physical actions, you don't learn them from scratch. That's not a really good way to do things. You learn all the things that you can do in a hierarchical manner. You build up very simple motor primitives for walking, this is one motor primitive. This is another one. Once you learn them, then you start to put them together and you get 
a bigger behavior. Then you can start to stitch those together. Walk, then run. Walk, then jump over the hurdle, then run a bit, jump over the hurdle, run, jump, run, jump, run, jump. We can keep stacking more and more complex behaviors in a hierarchical manner. When you learn to play a musical instrument, of course, you don't learn an entire piece of music all at once and then learn an enti another entire piece of music at once. You learn chords, however that works, depending on the instrument. You learn different chords. Then you learn how to stack them together into phrases. Then you learn how to stack phrases together. It's a often unsung building block of intelligence. It's so familiar and so obvious, we don't even realize that we're doing it. If you want to be intelligent here in the real world and be able to flexibly do lots of different complicated things, like walk and run and play the piano and play the violin, better to learn them and put them together in a hierarchical manner. OK, that makes sense. How the heck do we get a robot to do the same thing? How do we get it to learn to do different things like lift a block up and down three times and then shift a block left and right three times without that robot learning all of those behaviors from scratch every time? Why would it be bad for the robot to just learn them from scratch every time? Absolutely, right? So it's going to take it a long time to do it. Let's assume this robot has all the time in the world. Time is not an issue. Compute is not an issue. This human teacher has infinite patience. Even then, there's a disadvantage for the robot to learning all of these simple behaviors from scratch every time. There's absolutely no flexibility. There's no flexibility, right? Hey, robot, I want you to go like this now, right? Or go like this now. Or I want you to do three times left and right, then up and down three times, then forward and back three times, and repeat that whole sequence 17 times. It's got to learn that whole thing from scratch again. Not a good way to do that. So in this experiment, what the investigators tackled was how do we evolve all of the parameters for a CTRNN that controls this robot so that it's able to learn different motor primitives one, here's another one, and then after training, be able to stitch them together in new combinations and permutations. Okay, here we go. Here's how they did this. Okay, here's the simplest possible way to do this. What you're seeing in panel A down here, hopefully you can see this from the back, is maybe we create a CTRNN with one fully connected subset of neurons. We're going to wire up all of these neurons, and these neurons are going to be responsible for up and down. We're going to stitch together these neurons. We're going to wire up all these neurons with synapses, but cut all of the synapses that connect this group of neurons to this group of neurons, and make this neural module responsible for uh, this is responsible for left and right. This is responsible for up and down. Wire up all of these, cut all of these connections, and train or evolve this CTRNN so that these neurons control forward and back. You might remember back towards the beginning of the semester, we talked about the subsumption architecture, which is like basically a set of stacked Breitenberg vehicles. And the Bradenburg vehicle that keeps the robot from smashing itself to pieces is in charge most of the time. If the robot is not in danger of smashing itself to pieces, then it's free to turn towards the dirtier part of the carpet and turn away from the cleaner part of the carpet. Where did we see this? What is this thing called? It's a, it's a Roomba. Inside the Roomba is the subsumption architecture. The Roomba is basically running a stack. It, it's ha it houses a stack of Breitenberg vehicles. And vehicle one, two, or three can take control of the motors depending on what the sensors are saying. That's one way to do things. And works pretty well if you're a Roomba. And the only particular motor primitive you ever need to do is this and this. It's OK. But if there are three or 10 or 100 or 1,000 different motor primitives you need to do and you need to stack and make more, three or 10 or 100 or 1,000 Breitenberg vehicles, it doesn't scale very well. Yeah? 
Is there one part of your brain that's responsible for you playing the violin and another for playing soccer and another for playing soccer on a rainy day and another one for playing soccer on a sunny day, another one for playing on AstroTurf, another one for playing on natural grass? Not a very scalable way to do things. So in this paper, the investigators create a CTRNN, and I've just copied and pasted the, uh, uh, the differential equation describing the behavior of an individual neuron in a CTRNN over here. And they arrange things in the following way. They, they allowed all the neurons to wire up to everybody else, but the investigators um, clamped the time constants. Evolution was, play, was, was free to tinker with the weights, the gains, and the thetas, but the investigators are going to set the time constants themselves based on their own intuition. This is always difficult to do, but possible in this case. What's the intuition? The intuition is visualized down here. We're going to set the time constant for some of the neurons to be Woody Allen neurons. We're going to set the time constants to be close to zero so that these neurons can react and change values very quickly. These fast neurons are going to be connected to the motors. They set some, they took some other neurons in the CTRNN and set those to have high time constants or high magnitude time constants to make a set of Eeyore neurons. These neurons respond very slowly. What's the intuition here? Why did they do this? Absolutely. So you can think of these slow neurons as like the conductors of an orchestra. As you can see with this slowly changing purple value, this is meant to represent the slowly changing uh, act activity of a slow neuron. It's like a conductor. When the value of that neuron is at an um, intermediate value, that value of the slow neuron is influencing all the other neurons through synapses including the fast neurons. And evolution is going to try and tune all of those synapses and gains and thetas so that that intermediate value of the slow neurons pushes the fast neurons into this pattern. If the slow neurons slowly shift to some other pattern that, push, that causes a different influence on all the other neurons, including the fast neurons, so that they shift from doing this to doing this. Make sense? OK. What particular uh, values of w and g and theta will cause all this to happen? Who knows? This is where we pass things off to the evolutionary algorithm. We're not going to talk about the fitness function. I'll just give you sort of a, a high-level overview of how this works. The fitness function is going to just select the, the fitness function is going to try and tune all the w's and g's and thetas so that when these neurons receive an outside value of 1, this value is actually coming from the human investigator. The human investigator plugs a, a value of 1 into one of the slow neurons. From that neuron's point of view, this just looks like a sensor value, right? It suddenly just receives a value of 1, which influences the behavior of that slow neuron. And when that slow neuron gets a value of 1, the fast neurons should cause the robot to do this. That's one part of the fitness function. If that neuron receives a value of 2, whatever it does, it should cause the fast ones to do this. And same thing for forward and back. So far, so good. So in theory, if the evolutionary algorithm tunes all of the g's and w's and thetas correctly, the human investigator should be able to play the robot like an instrument. When the investigator presses 1, the robot does this. When the robot presses 2, it does this. And when the investigator presses 1 again, it goes back to doing this. And then the investigator can take one step back 
and send a series of values here. 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 1, 3, 3, 1, 2, 2, at a slow sequence. And that's, in, in essence, the investigator saying, shake the block up and down three times, then push it forward, back and forth three times, and so on. We want to see how well the robot does at being flexible. Somebody mentioned flexibility. Send a new unseen combination of requests for motor primitives, and the robot should be able to, to do it. So far, so good? OK, we got four minutes left. We should be able to finish this out. I'm not going to talk about this figure. I invite the grad students to go read the actual paper that are interested in the details. The only thing I want you to take away from this complicated picture here is that it's basically a whole spaghetti mess. We have a whole bunch of neurons. I think there were, uh, I can't remember how many there are. There's a large number of neurons in the CTRNN. They're setting some of the time constants to five which are the fast neurons. They're setting some of them to slow. I don't know how they got the values of 5 and 70, but the investigators are sending in the goal. They're telling the robot what it should be doing at a high level. Shake the block up and down three times. Back here into slow neurons. So the conductor is basically receiving a piece of music, and then the conductor is pushing the fast neurons into different distinct patterns. OK, last figure we're going to look at today. This is what you're looking at. We're looking inside the brain of an evolved CTRNN that's controlling the robot. So evolution has tuned all the Ws and Gs and thetas so that when the investigator presses 1, when the investigator presses 3, and so on. OK, let's have a look. Uh, let's read these off. Each individual panel here, each panel on the horizontal axis, corresponds to a few seconds of time in the robot's exp experience. We're not looking at evolutionary time here. We're looking at a few seconds. In this particular panel here on the vertical axis, we're looking at proprioception. Proprioception is a particular uh, type of sensation that records where your body is in space, or basically the angles of all of your joints. So there is one, two, three, four different lines here. I think these correspond to the two elbows and the, four, and the two shoulders of the robot. So we can see that the angles of the robot's joints are oscillating three times when it received the command to shake the block up and down three times doesn't necessarily mean that it's actually going up and down three times. It's just doing something. The robot is repeating some motor primitive three times. When the robot receives a different command, shake the block left and right, there's a different pattern, a different oscillation three times. This is a visual sensation, which we haven't talked about. This is the teaching signal. So this is the uh, the teacher actually holding the robot and shaking it in the appropriate way. And this is the robot with its motors trying to follow along. So each of these individual panels, this is, the this is the teacher saying, this is what you should feel. This is the teacher saying, this is what you should see. And this is the robot saying, this is what I actually feel. And this is the robot saying, this is what I actually see myself doing. We've got one minute left. Okay. Down here on the horizontal axis, we still have about five seconds of the robot's experience. Each row in this panel down here corresponds to one of the neurons in the CTRNN. Within each row, a black pixel represents that that uh, neuron is firing with a big positive value, a value near plus one, and a white or gray pixel indicates that that neuron is firing with a value that's near minus <coughs> one. What's going on among all the fast neurons? You can see that oscillation. So if you look in this part of the panel, you can see that the fast Woody Allen neurons are oscillating three times. And then when, they, when the robot receives a different teaching signal, 
The robots, the, the fast neurons also start to oscillate back and forth three times at some other different pattern. Down here, these are the slow neurons. And if you look at the first part of this lowermost panel, you'll notice that there is no little to no oscillation. The slow neurons over here, the conductors, are holding constant some particular set of activities, and that's pushing these fast neurons into an oscillation back and forth three times, which, you'll have to trust me, corresponds to the robot actually doing what it was told to do. The neurons then, the slow neurons then receive a different teaching signal, which pushes them into a different set of patterns. And there's a little bit of an oscillation in the slow neurons, but essentially they start pushing the fast neurons into a different fast oscillation, which again, you'll have to trust me, corresponds to left and right, back and forth. Okay. We're out of time. Um, if there's any questions about this, we'll, we'll field those questions on Tuesday. You have a quiz due tonight. Undergrads, you're working on A5. Grads, you're reaching the finish line with A9 and 10. See you Tuesday morning.